Okay, now that we understand air masses, we can discuss fronts. A front is a transition zone between two air masses of different densities. And it's often a transition zone between two air masses of different temperatures because temperature differences cause density differences. Fronts also can separate air masses with different humidities because air masses with different humidity properties have different densities as well. How can one identify a um, front on a weather map? Well, there's different um, indicators. One is a sharp temperature change. Temperature changes along a weather front. Another um, identifier of a front is a sharp change in dew point. Remember, dew point is a measure of how much moisture is in the atmosphere. Okay, the higher the dew point, the more moisture or water vapor in the air. So if there's a sharp change in dew point, that means represents a sharp change in the air's moisture content. Okay, that's a, a signal of a front. Wind direction tends to shift along a front. Uh, pressure will change along a front. And fronts are associated with lower pressure and hence clouds and precipitation. Okay, remember low pressure tends to be associated with rising air. That is surface low pressure tends to be associated with rising air. And typically fronts um, are associated with clouds and precipitation. Not all um, but they tend to be associated with some clouds and precipitation, okay? There are four main types of fronts in meteorology, and you may have heard of these. The cold front is the most dramatic front in meteorology in terms of the actual weather that occurs along it. It's drawn as a blue line with filled in triangles. And by the way, the triangles, the direction of the triangles, the um, direction they're pointing show you the direction the front is moving, okay? A warm front is drawn as a red line with filled in semicircles. The semicircles indicate the direction of movement of the front. A stationary front is drawn basically as an alternating uh, cold or, and warm front line, while the occluded front is drawn as a purple line with um, alternating semicircles and triangles that are filled in. And we'll talk about each of these fronts, the typical weather associated with them, how they're different, okay? And later on, we'll be talking about mid-latitude cyclones, that is uh, cyclones, areas of low pressure that form in the mid-latitudes. But before we do that, we need to understand fronts because um, mid-latitude cyclones are made up of fronts. We, not, we need to understand the fronts before we can understand the mid-latitude cyclones. So let's start our discussion of these four types of fronts with the first um, on this list, cold front. Now for a cold front, moving cold air forces warm air up at a sharp angle. Um, the reason a cold front is called such is because the cold air is moving, okay? A cold front separates cold air and warm air, but the cold air is moving. The cold air pushes into the warm air and forces it up in, at an abrupt angle. And temperatures, drop after passage of a cold front. They can quickly drop um, sometimes several degrees in a matter of minutes, okay? Cold fronts are associated with severe weather. Out of all, there's four types of fronts that we mentioned. Cold fronts tend to be associated the most with thunderstorms, okay, possibly even uh, uh, tornadoes occasionally. Thunderstorms have different hazards we'll be talking about, including lightning, thunder, hail, OK? 
okay cold fronts generally move at speeds of 20 to 30 miles per hour okay so cold fronts generally move at speeds of 20 to 30 miles per hour they tend to move toward the southeast or the east in uh, North America okay so they tend to move from northwest to southeast or west to east this figure shows a cold front on a surface weather map and weather observations in the vicinity of the cold front and further away from it now these circles show cloud cover coverage if it's if the circle is filled in it means the sky is overcast okay the lines um with the tails are wind barbs they're showing wind direction and speed the tail the end of the barb shows you the direction the wind's coming from okay so um behind the cold front the winds are coming from the northwest okay behind it the winds are coming from the northwest uh to the north of the cold front the winds are coming from the northwest and there are some high wind speeds okay um including up to 30 miles per hour okay ahead of the cold front south of the cold front the winds are coming from the southwest okay the winds are coming from the southwest so you see a shift in wind direction okay you see a shift in wind direction one of the indicators of front you also see a change in temperature notice south of the warm front uh, cold front the temperatures are in the upper 40s to mid 50s that is just south of it and then as you go further south okay temperatures are in the upper 50s right at the bottom of the diagram the temperatures are shown by the um, numbers in the upper left of the circle dew points are shown in the lower left of that uh, below the circle okay now this green shaded area represents precipitation okay so fronts are, can be associated with precipitation okay so in the vicinity of this cold front you see this green shaded area where uh rain is occurring now if you go far enough north um of the cold front you do see this uh there's an area of shading of white where actually snow is occurring okay because it's cold enough okay the blue um filled in arrow that says cold air shows you uh the direction of the air flow okay it's coming from the northwest whereas and that's north of the cold front south of the cold front it's coming from the southwest okay here is what a cold front looks like um geometrically geometrically okay you see the cold front shown by the blue line with the triangles and behind it you have cold air that's pushing into warm air and so the warm air gets forced up at an abrupt angle cb means cumulonimbus cumulonimbus clouds can form along the cold front and those are thunderstorm clouds okay you'll notice the anvil top you'll notice that fuzzy appearance near the top of the cumulonimbus cloud where it's glaciated composed only of ice crystals okay you see a lightning bolt okay um behind the cold front temperatures right behind it they're in the upper 30s to low 40s and as you go further uh west in this figure temperatures drop into the mid-20s ahead of the cold front temperatures are in the 50s okay behind the cold front winds are coming from the northwest ahead of it they're coming from the southwest okay what type of weather is associated with cold fronts before the passage of a cold front there are south or southwest winds warm temperatures and a steady pressure drop as the cold front approaches pressure drops because the cold front is an area of low pressure so before it passes as it's approaching an area pressure will drop if you had a barometer you would see the pressure falling 
high clouds are found hundreds of miles ahead of a cold front okay so sometimes the first indicator of an appro approaching cold front is uh, cirrus clouds there's thin wispy high clouds okay there may be a few showers ahead of the cold front especially if the air mass is unstable if it's warm and moist um, in the summertime you can have showers even thunderstorms ahead of the cold front dew points are high and steady okay now as the cold front passes an area what weather happens well the winds pick up they become gusty and they shift they shift direction okay they shift direction temperatures suddenly drop and they drop abruptly pressure uh, bottoms out as the cold front passes there are convective clouds such as cumulus congestus cumulonimbus there are heavy showers and thunderstorms okay Cold fronts are associated with heavy showery precipitation. Dew points sharply drop. So not only are cold fronts associated with um, sudden drops in temperature, but sudden drops in dew point as well. Okay. So as the cold front passes, the air go is uh, becoming colder and drier. Okay. The reason precipitation is showery and also can be um, intense is because of the fast movement of cold fronts and the abrupt angle that they force warm air up at okay by the way if a cold front passes during the morning time uh the daytime highs may occur then occasionally um a location's day uh, maximum daily temperature will occur in the morning and then a cold front passes and the temperature drops the rest of the day after the cold front passes winds are from the west or northwest temperatures continue to decrease but not as fast as during the passage itself okay so as it um, continues moving further away past an area temperatures will tr continue to drop as colder air comes in from the uh, northwest for example pressure rises and the reason is because again the cold front is an area of low pressure and so after it passes uh pressure begins to rebound there can be cumulus clouds after the cold front passes um this is especially true in the bay area in the winter time um after the cold front passes um there can be unsettled um weather okay so sometimes our our most intense rain occurs with the passage of a cold front and then after it passes there can be showery precipitation and sometimes cumulus cumulus congestus clouds okay showers do tend to decrease though as the cold front continues to pass and move um and uh, the reason is because um colder drier air is filtering in right and the colder and drier the air the less moisture it can hold right makes sense and dew points lower as that uh, drier air uh, moves in okay now how about a warm front what kind of weather what are the characteristics of a warm front what kind of weather is it associated with um warm fronts have warm air moving okay so a cold front has the cold air moving into the warm air for a warm front warmer less dense air forces cold air to rise and it basically slowly um, ascends over the uh, colder air okay temperatures slowly rise during the passage of a warm front the change in temperature is not as dramatic as for a cold front okay so while a cold front is associated with um sudden drops in temperature a warm front is associated with more slow steady rises in temperature okay warm fronts are associated with light steady precipitation that's different from cold fronts which are associated with more heavy and um showery more showery precipitation warm fronts produce inversions remember a temperature inversion is um, a condition where temperature increases with height 
Warm fronts generally move at speeds of 10 to 15 miles per hour. So they do move at slower speeds than cold fronts. And when we talk about mid-latitude cyclones, we'll talk about how um, cold fronts catch up to warm fronts because they move faster than them. Here's what a warm front would look like on a surface weather map. South of the warm front, you see this red, this orange arrow showing warm air. You see temperatures in the um, upper 40s to mid 50s south of it. Then just ahead of it, you have rain shown by the green shading with temperatures in the upper 30s. As you go further to the northeast, you see the pink shading representing mixture of precipitation. Temperatures are around freezing. And then if you go far enough north, East of the front, temperatures are low enough where all the precipitation is snow. You see the snow sh shown by the white shading, okay? And as you go farther northeast of the front, the warm front, temperatures continue to drop into the low 20s, okay? Here's what a cross-section warm front looks like. It's different than for a cold front, okay? To the west, of the warm front, basically the left of the figure, you have some SC stratocumulus clouds, not much precipitation. And along the warm front, you have warm air slowly moving up over cold air. Okay, and you, you so the um, angle at which the warm air rises above the cold air is more general, okay, and smooth, less abrupt than the angle at which the cold air in a cold front forces the warm air up at, okay. You can have fog along the warm front just ahead of it. And you do see this more, um, this larger band of precipitation ahead of the warm front, okay? For a cold front, you have a more, a more narrow band of precipitation, okay? Only right ahead and along the front. But for a warm front, you have precipitation extending over a larger distance ahead of it than for ahead of a cold front, okay? And um, Nimbostratus NS is a cloud that produces rain. Okay, remember there's only two types of clouds that produce rain, cumulonimbus, Nimbostratus. For the rain associated with the cold front, um, it tends to fall from cumulonimbus, but the rain associated with a warm front falls from Nimbostratus. And you um, can um, determine that a warm front is approaching by noted by noticing that clouds are lowering okay so sometimes ahead of the warm front hundreds of miles ahead of it um you can see some cirrus strat cirrus and cirrus stratus clouds and then they begin to lower into alto stratus and eventually nimbo stratus and produce rain okay what's the weather like um, in a warm front. Well, before it passes, the winds are from the south or southeast, okay? And there are cool temperatures. Pressure falls and clouds lower, okay? There can be light to moderate precipitation ahead of a warm front, okay? And as the warm front approaches, dew point increases steadily, okay? By the way, the temperatures before the passage of a warm front are cool, but not as cold as after a cold front passage, okay? Now, as the warm front passes, temperatures rise steadily. Now, they don't rise as quickly during a warm front passage as temperatures drop during a cold front passage. Winds are variable, okay? Again, cold fronts are more dramatic um, than warm fronts. Okay, we're talking about how cold front is kind of the most intense front. And uh, while cold fronts have gusty shifting winds, warm fronts have winds that shift, but the winds are more variable and light during its passage than the winds associated with a cold front passage. Pressure is steady. Um, there are low clouds during the passage of a warm front, like stratus. There can be light precipitation, although some warm fronts actually don't have precipitation right along them. They may have precipitation ahead of them, but there are some warm fronts actually where 
they aren't associated with precipitation, only clouds. So as the warm front is passing, um, you may see some clouds, but might not experience any rain. There are steady dew points associated with the passage of a uh, warm front. Now, after the warm front passes, winds um, are south or southwest. Okay, so before a warm front uh, passes an area, the winds are from the east, southeast, and then after it passes, they have shifted to the south, the southwest. Temperatures are warmer, okay? Um, there will be a slight rise in pressure after the warm front passage because the warm front is an area of low pressure. So after it passes, the low pressure is moving away from area, so higher pressure is um, building in. But then pressure begins to fall. And the reason is because behind the warm front is a cold front, usually. Um, and so even though the warm front's passed and now the pressure's increasing, because that low pressure is moving away, uh, a new area of low pressure associated with the cold front is approaching. So pressure starts dropping again, okay, in advance of the cold front, behind the warm front. There's little precipitation um, after the warm front passage, um, generally, with the exception of in the summertime, especially for warm front passages in the uh, south and in the Midwest. Sometimes the air is unstable enough, it's at the surface warm and humid, that you can get thunderstorms forming, okay? But they may be more convective, that is, they're not caused by fronts, they're caused by um, convection, okay? Uh, Dew point continues to rise as that more humid air builds in, and then it's steady, steadies, okay? Occluded fronts are a result of a cold front catching up to a warm front. Now, warm and cold fronts are usually part of a mid-latitude cyclone, and they travel together, okay? So typically, warm and cold fronts are part of a weather system called a mid-latitude cyclone, usually associated with three air masses. We'll be discussing mid-latitude cyclones more um, later in the lecture. And eventually, the cold front can catch up to and overtake the warm front because it travels at a faster speed. Where the cold front has met, um, has reached the warm front is called the occlusion, okay? And the occluded front is drawn as a purple line with filled in semicircles and uh, triangles pointing the same direction, okay? There's a couple types of occluded fronts. There's a cold occlusion shown on the left and a warm occlusion shown on the right. Cold occlusions can happen over the interior of the U.S. Um, um, to the right of the uh, occluded front, that is to the east of it, there are cold temperatures. And to the west of it, there are very cold temperatures, okay? And then between the cold front and the warm front, temperatures are warm, okay? For the warm occlusion that can occur in uh, the Pacific Northwest, okay, there are cold temperatures to the east of the occluded front and cool temperatures, not as cold, to the west of it, okay, with warm air um, between the cold front and the warm front, okay. So for the cold occlusion, you have colder air colliding with uh, cold air. You have very cold air um, basically colliding with cold air. For the warm occlusion, you have cool air, not as cold, combining with colder air, okay? What type of weather is associated with occluded fronts? Um, well, before it passes, winds are either east, southeast, or south, okay? And temperatures are either cold or cool, depending on if it's a cold occluded front or a warm occluded front, okay? Clouds lower as the occluded front approaches, okay? So before it passes, there can be high clouds like cirrus, cirrus stratus, and then they lower into alto stratus, that mid-level cloud, and eventually nimbus stratus, the low cloud that produces rain, okay? There can be light, moderate, or heavy precipitation before the passage of a occluded front. It is complicated, okay? Uh, occluded fronts can have a variety of weather associated with them. 
There's poor visibility due to the precipitation and a steady dew point. Now, while the occluded front passes, winds are variable and temperatures either drop for the cold occluded front or rise for the warm occluded front. Pressure bottoms out um, and there can be nimbus stratus clouds producing rain, um, uh, mo uh, light to moderate rain, um, especially with the warm occluded front. But for a cold occluded front, there can be cumulonimbus clouds and heavy showery precipitation. Okay. Usually, uh, dew point drops during the passage of a cold front, uh, of an occluded front, especially if it's a cold occluded front. Now, after the occluded front passes, winds are from the west or northwest. Temperatures are either colder with the cold occluded front or milder, still cool, but milder, not as cold with the warm occluded front. And pressure usually rises, okay? There may be some leftover nimbus stratus clouds alto stratus clouds, um, especially with the warm occluded front, but with the cold occluded front, there can be some scattered cumulus clouds. There may be light to moderate precipitation behind the occluded front, but it's generally followed by clearing and improving visibility. Okay. Dew points slightly drop, although they may rise a bit if after passage of a warm occluded front. Now, Stationary fronts are called that because they don't move much. Okay, they're called stationary fronts because they're not really moving. They can be associated with some light precipitation. Um, they can form after a cold front or a warm front's dissipated. Okay, and um, um, they're not that exciting. Okay, stationary fronts can sometimes have no precipitation associated with them. So we won't spend a whole lot of time on stationary fronts. Um, now there's another um, transition zone uh, between two air masses that is not so much associated with changing temperature as a cold front or a warm front or occluded front is, but is more um, important with respect to the change in moisture content that occurs the dry line is a boundary separating continental tropical and maritime tropical air masses. It often forms over the central United States, in particular Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, where warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico meets hot, dry air from the southwestern states, including New Mexico and Arizona. Dew point temperatures can drop 25 degrees Fahrenheit per mile along the dry line, and it is important in severe weather formation. Winds are usually from the south or southeast to the east of the dry line, and west or southwest to the west of the dry line. Here is a figure showing a dry line over Texas. To the east of the dry line, temperatures are in the upper 80s to lower 90s, and dew points are in the mid 60s to the low 70s. So the air is very warm and uh, humid, okay? It's a maritime tropical air mass. To the west of the dry line, there's a continental um, tropical air mass in place. And you'll notice temperatures are warmer, okay, higher. In western Texas, temperatures are in the uh, mid to upper 90s, okay? But look at the dew points, they're much lower. The dew point temperatures in Western Texas are only in the 30s or even 20s in extreme Western Texas in the panhandle. So the temperatures increase a little bit as the dry line passes, but what changes a lot more is the dew point temperature. Okay, dew points drop from the upper 60s to low 70s to the mid 30s, okay? So um, a dry line is associated with a rapid change, rapid drop in dew point temperature, okay? Hence, after it passes, the air becomes much drier, okay? And again, these can be associated with severe weather formation. Sometimes 
uh, thunderstorms will actually occur along the dry line because it can um, force warm humid air to rise as the hot dry air um, collides with it.